So we're on to example eight. We're on to the idea of looking at complex numbers in a, a visual sense, you know, trying to represent them graphically. And we had a look in example seven about how we can use a Cartesian coordinate system with a real and imaginary axis to plot complex numbers with a horizontal and vertical kind of component part, which is all well and good. Uh, there's a second way of representing complex numbers, and I put up this picture here because it's kind of similar to this idea. You might recognize this type of screen. Um, certainly, if you haven't been in front of one, you might have seen them on TV or in a movie. It's the kind of thing you would see on a, a ship, a kind of sonar screen. And what you would see is this sweep, particularly that kind of bright line uh, that's, if I find it, this kind of uh, line, which is at about just coming up for 60 degrees. Um, that line, I've got it here, yeah. Uh, that line would kind of sweep around and there would be a, a kind of bright light. And that's simply the, the, the sonar detector sweeping round and round and round. And what it does is, of course, is it sends out um, a signal. And if there's anything in its way, some of that signal bounces back and it records that as an object. And in this screen here, we can see that there are actually potentially um, four objects, whether they're UFOs or other boats or uh, who knows. But the idea being that we can describe the position of any of these little shiny dots, not so much in an X and Y coordinate grid, but by two other pieces of information. We can describe it by the distance that it is from the origin. Now, the origin represents the position of the boat, say. So if I were to take this, oops, oops. if I were to take the, let's get rid of these things anyway. If we were to take this highest value point, and if I were to measure the distance from the boat to that dot, that would be a, a positive value. It doesn't matter whether it's to the side or behind or ahead. It's a positive distance from the boat. But the other piece of information you would need is the angle or the bearing of that point round from north. And in this case, it looks like it's on a bearing of about 338, something like that. We don't know what the distance is because we don't know what each of the uh, these lines represent the rings that go from the origin might be one kilometer, um, in which case that might be to one, two, three, four and a half kilometers away. So we have a system that's called polar coordinates, where instead of it being a, an, a, a distance along an x-axis, a distance up a y-axis, we have an actual distance to an object and uh, a, a, an angle from some kind of relative point and when we're dealing with um, position usually in a ship or an aeroplane, we would usually take north zero, zero, zero degrees as a reference. Okay, that's, that's polar coordinates. Now we have effectively a polar form in our complex numbers. That's the second type of Argand diagram. The only thing is that what we tend to do is we use zero Um, from here, zero degrees, and that kind of relates back to our quadrant diagrams in trigonometry when we were working on um, looking at quadrants 180, 360 degrees. So we can represent a, a complex number by a, a distance and an angle, okay? And that's what we call polar form, okay? And what we're going to look here is what are the, those two key components. So I've still got a set of coordinate axes, real and imaginary. But this time we're, we're less interested in the, the absolute kind of X and Y part of it, the horizontal and vertical components. So I'm actually more interested in, well, if that's my complex number, how far is it away from the origin? What's its actual magnitude, if that were kind of vector form? And what's its angle? from the horizontal, and it's the positive direction of the, uh, the horizontal axis. So those are our two values that we're actually interested in and what we use to represent the complex number. This R 
like a radius uh, of a line or the, the magnitude, we actually call them modulus in terms of um, complex numbers. So R is called the modulus of Z, sometimes shortened to mod Z, and more often we're going to actually use a third form, which is a Z with um, a pair of parallel lines, modulus of Z. Now you can see from the X and Y part if, uh, that if X here is the horizontal component and Y here is the vertical component, we're just dealing with a right angle triangle and we can use Pythagoras' theorem for that. So we can say that R squared is X squared plus Y squared. Notice we're not carrying the I with it. Or in other words, the actual modulus is the square root of X squared plus Y squared. We're going to go I'll note that down on the next screen. And similarly, we've got a familiar um, diagram for our argument because again, we've got a right angle triangle and we've got the idea of the opposite and adjacent. So we've got the idea of the tan theta equals y over x. And that's going to be the argument of the interesting terminology argument, but that's the, the, the expression that, that we use. Arg z, or we just usually use theta as a symbol. So in summary, what we're seeing here is that given a complex number in Cartesian form, where you know it's real and imaginary parts, we can convert that into polar form by saying that the modulus, which is the kind of R value, is the square root of A squared plus B squared. And we can either say that tan theta equals B over A, which is the imaginary part divided by the real part, or you can write it as theta equals inverse tan of B over A. So these are two formulae that you need to know to use it. And you'll use them hopefully often enough that it's not going to be an issue. So there's one last thing to kind of bear in mind when we're trying to find our angle. And I'll take you through this in this example. You'll find the modulus and argument of Z equals 1 plus I. First thing that you should do is draw a little sketch of the Cartesian version of it. So we've got a real and imaginary. And if Z is 1 plus I, that's 1 on the real axis and plus 1 on the imaginary axis. And I can say that that is my complex number Z. Okay. And what we want to do is to find the magnitude of this line here. And I want to find the angle from the horizontal. You could probably work out the fact that because it's one along and one up, we're basically rising at an angle of 45 degrees. But we'll, uh, if you can bring some of that knowledge to bear, that would be excellent. But let's look at it from our two formulae. We're saying that the modulus of Z, the distance from the origin, it's the square root of, now you can always use a squared plus b squared if you want a formula to start with, but it's the two value components. So in this case, the real value is i is 1 squared. I know that it says plus i. It really means plus 1i. So I'm going to do, again, plus 1 squared. It's positive 1 squared, which gives me the square root of 2. And we'll leave that in third form just now. So the distance from the origin to the complex number z is root 2. So we say its modulus is root 2. The argument is slightly different. We can say that theta is the inverse tan of b over a, which in this case is 1 over 1. It is the inverse tan of 1. The tan of what angle is one positive one where well, we actually know that there are two answers to that because we can also treat this diagram as our quadrant diagram and we know that tan is positive in both the first and the third quadrants but rather than it being a mystery and saying oh there are two answers there aren't two answers because we know from our argan diagram that the angle is a first quadrant angle and that's why it's really important to draw a sketch first of all to, to determine 
which of the two possible angles that it could be. So as you would normally do in a trig equation, you actually would want to find out what the associated acute angle is. And we know that the inverse tan of 1, the acute uh, answer to that would be 45 degrees or pi over 4. And it so happens, of course, that because it's a first quadrant angle, that we can therefore write, well, let's, let's write down, we know it's a first quadrant angle. So the argument theta is equal to just pi over 4. So we're going to have a look at uh, another uh, complex number in example 9 where it's a different um, quadrant. It's out with the, the, the first quadrant and we have to just be careful how to calculate the argument. But that's an introduction to how to find the modulus an argument and that's going to help us to describe complex numbers in polar form rather than in Cartesian form.